Okay, so good afternoon to everyone, or good morning, depending on your position in the in the in the world at the moment. Um, my name is Andre Gomes. I'm from uh, Elite Performance Football Project, and uh, today we'll have um, the Elite Webinar. And today we'll have the presence of the main guest, Andro Fistonich, the Academy Deputy uh, Director from the Academy of Iduk Split from Croatia, uh, and our special guests that will jump in uh, to, to discuss, to discuss the, the thematics of, uh, of the presentation of Andro. Uh, Bruno Costa uh, is the head of recruitment and scouting from San Jose Earthquakes from the MLS, the US, United States of America, and the presence as well of Gustavo Almeida, the head coach of the under 17 of uh, Corinthians from Brazil. Um, it's a pleasure. Uh, for us, Elite Performance Football, to have these three top quality professionals in our, our project. Um, and we'll have the presentation of Andro that is based in talent identification and development, Croatia case study. So uh, based in what Croatia have, have been doing for, for a couple of years now and doing so well that are having them in the, the, as finalists in the last World Cup in 2018. So Andro will show us his uh, input of what he's been doing at the moment in Croatia and the quality work that uh, all the professionals and players as well are, are doing in that, that country. So uh, thank you everyone for, for joining in and thank you Andro, Gustavo and Bruno to accepting our, our challenge. Um, I don't know if someone of uh, of you three want to to say something but if you don't have nothing to say we'll start right away with andrew in this presentation let's move forward <laughs> <laughs> okay let's go then let's go uh first of all thank you andre for this this is my second time being here first time i was on the seat of the panelist and uh, this time on the front row uh, also thanks to Gustavo who I I can say I know I met in Brazil when I was uh, making actually my master thesis and uh, Bruno Costa who I now I'm introduced to but I lived in the Bay Area and San around San Francisco so I know some things about San Jose earthquakes and the area over there and I I'm pretty sure it's going to be a good discussion uh, so about the presentation so it's basically about talent dedication and development. And I would say the environment where Croatian football players are developed. So you can get the idea of what is going on here and then how we are adapting to, the, to, the, to, the, to this environment in Croatia. Because environment is something that, that is, I think, like a first step into the analysis and then obviously creating some kind of development plan as environment in Croatia or uh, around earthquakes in USA or in Brazil, it's completely different. So obviously I here represent also my uh, current club, Hajduk Split. So I'm going to talk also about, when I talk about development, I'm going to be mostly talking about what we are doing in our club. That's more or less very similar to what other clubs in Croatia are doing. So let's start. So when we talk about some kind of phases of development in Hajduk Split, we separate it in this way. So uh, over here, you can see that we have uh, three phases in the academy. Phase one, U8 to U11, phase two, U12 to U15, and phase three, U16 to U19. At the moment, we have a B team that plays in the second division and phase four, which is basically professional football or something that we are trying to prepare the kids for what is waiting them. So when we talk about our club and our environment, uh, at the moment, uh, we are on the market and market is uh, something that's, whether we like it or not, but football is a business. So there is a market and there is a power. Uh, at the moment we are here, we are in the place where we have to develop the young players. We have to give them 
opportunity as young, in youngest as young as early, earliest uh, phases possible, so that they can develop in the Croatian league their full potential, and this would be around 22, 23 if everything is going right, and then we sell them to the clubs like in the second rank of European football, like Bayer, Monaco, Benfica, whose goal is to buy cheap, obviously, uh, re uh, or not redesign, but like I would say the kind of give, give a fine tuning to those players and then sell them to the clubs that want to have the player at the peak of his performance to win the Champions League, their uh, in Premier League, German League, Bundesliga, or the Spanish League. After that, when the player player's maximum performance is going down, they more or less getting rid of them. So this is the one life cycle of some individual football player. And we have to adapt to this game. And at the moment, our power, our financial power, our power on the market is over here. So we have to know that we have to push as young as possible from 17, 18 years old players in give them three to four years, maybe five, maybe one, and then sell them somewhere else. So when we talk about the market again, this is basically where the whole football is based. Yeah, more red it is, the more, I would say, the more big clubs and the more money at the end. Uh, so when this center of the football, uh, or maybe here a little bit, uh, wants to, when they are missing some kind of talent, they look, for example, in South America, Brazil, Uruguay, Argentina, they are looking for the skills. When they look from Africa, they look for the physicality, or it doesn't have to be from Africa, it can be from Afro-American uh, players. When they look Asia, it's more or less the discipline. When they look in the Germany, it's the system. When they look in the uh, Portugal, Spain, it's the system plus skills. Now, why I'm saying all of this, it's basically I'm trying to give you a picture of what is market looking to find in Croatia. And usually in the past, in the history, they were looking for the players that had creativity and the skills. Yeah, this is something that we were selling on the market and that market was missing and that we have it. So now this is very important because obviously you won't come to look for a huge, strong defender extremely fast in Croatia. It might happen once in 10 years, but every generation we at least have two, three players in Croatia that have a creativity and the skills. Players like Luka Modric, Kovacic, Rebic, uh, Rakitic even, he's coming from uh, Switzerland development program. So this is something that we can offer to the market. So now, what is, uh, there is something in the chat, okay. Uh, something, this is something that how, how we structure the influence on the individual player. So this is the split model by the Boucher. It was made on the other sports, not football, but it's, I think, very interesting. Um, uh, like a kind of benchmark to, to, to talk about development. So when we talk about the micro level, we talk about basically uh, everyday influence on the player. So this is an individual coach, head coach that works every day with him, uh, parents, girlfriend, and uh, the best friends, let's say like that. When we talk about meso level, this is something as a curriculum or like a methodology plan that we work that we can basically adapt. For example, in Hajduk Split, we have one way. In Corinthians, you guys have another second way. And some Cosea Artequakes have a third way. So this is something that can be reshaped, or it's kind of the politics of the sport club. Well, uh, while when we talk, uh, while when we talk about the macro level we talk basically about the things that we as a football club cannot influence on it this is where we are so when we talk about croatia for example uh this is like ge uh, geographical weather yeah croatia has the most sunny days in europe 
So this is the kind of the fact, and we cannot change this. This is where we are. Uh, if we are in Norway, we're probably going to have the, I don't know, least sunny days in Europe. So this is something that we have to adapt to it. If this is also, for example, the political situation in the country. Are we democracy? Are we uh, dictatorship? Are we this or that? And things like this, yeah? Are we a very poor country? Are we a very rich country? And so on. So what is very interesting about this is a lot of times we as a football uh, clubs, coaches, we think that we can uh, we can basically influence so much the development of the football player. According to, to some science, it says that macro level, and that's the one that we cannot control, is influencing 50% the development of one child or one football player. While these two, meso level and micro level, we can influence it 50% together. Yeah. And this is what I'm going to be presenting, like how first I'm going to show you what is the macro level of Croatia, what is going on over here without me being here or Hajduk split. And then what we as a club are doing to use this analysis and then to create the development plan and identification plan so that we can get the best, those creativity and skillful players. So before I go, I always like to use this quote when I'm analyzing this. It says that sometimes a negative trends in society brings the positive uh, things in football or vice versa. Sometimes negative, uh, so, sorry, sometimes positive things in society brings negative things for the football. And I'm going to explain what I mean. So when we analyze Croatia, I already mentioned we have the most sunny days in the Europe. So this is a very good thing for developing the football players. The kids can be outside, it can play, they can play football, we can train outside, we don't need gyms and so on. Yeah. So this is a very positive thing. Second thing is one of these that I mentioned. It's a negative trend in the society, but it's actually very positive for the football. So Croatia is in social mobility, and social mobility basically means that. If you are um, uh, born poor, like your parents were poor, most likely you're going to remain poor by the end of your life or you won't move so much up in the level of the societies. Yeah. So the Croatia has problems with this, especially comparing it to the Euro European Union. While if you go to some countries like, I don't know, USA or, uh, uh, or for example, England, for example, if you are studying, if you finish your college, you can move up in your life and so on. So, as I mentioned, this is something, this is not good in the society, but for football, this is great because football is something that can make your kid from poor rich if he, is, if he has a qualities. Like there is no way of uh, lying or maybe there is no nepotism. There is, there is, but like much, much less. If you're a good player, everyone can see it, yeah? So that's why we have a very big pool of the football players because every parent wants his kid to try in the football. And then if he's not that good enough, okay, then he's going to go study or what, whatsoever he's going to do. So third thing, it's something positive in society, but actually brings the negative uh, trends in the football. And that's the digitalization or technology. So we entered European Union about, I think, seven years ago, uh, you know, Education is coming, computers, internet, everything is here. But this actually brought uh, problems for football because they're not just playing on the street all the time, but they, they're spending a lot of time on these new, new ways of having fun. Yeah. So, two more things. Culture. So in Croatia, we have a culture of the, or lifestyle of the risk takers. So basically, I would compare it like this. You can see this like a picture of the heart and the brain, right? And if if we talk about us as a people in Croatia, we like to a lot of times make decisions when we are emotional, when our heart is basically deciding what we should do. While, for example, when I uh, when I lived in Germany, I can see that people there, in general, they are much more rational. So they will they will listen to their brain more than to their heart. 
when they are making decisions. So now this is also a question, is this good or bad for the country? I think it's, it's bad when you're not rational. But in a football, we can put a question mark on this because in football, you have to make decisions in a second. You have to actually take a risk in order to succeed. So maybe this is something that's not bad at all. Yeah. And then uh, last thing is the importance of the football. So we have, again, this is some trend that's negative in the society. Sometimes for us, the football is like more important than the life, than the morals, than the laws. Yeah. Sometimes let's say we have a, there is a club, let's say in Croatia that has a president that's corrupted, that maybe he steals something or doesn't matter. The whole club, maybe it's uh, wrong or blah, blah, blah. Uh, but if they win the championship, you know, ah, things are fine, you know, doesn't matter, they are successful, this is great, yeah? And this, this is happening in Croatia. Now, it's probably, you know, it's a question mark, is it good or bad for the football? But uh, this, for example, things like this, this would never happen in Germany. You know, in Germany, for them, it's more important that everyone plays by the law rather than that someone is successful. Yeah, or it's bribing the referees or something like this. Uh, now, when you saw all of this, you can we can actually question if the Croatia is the uh, best place to develop the young players. Uh, but then the last question is, do we actually need optimal environment to develop a football player? Because if everything is easy, maybe this is not the right place to develop a top football player because the football when they enter the professional life, is the basically modern gladiatorship. Yeah, you have to survive every weekend. So this is a quote I like to use a lot when I speak with the parents, players, and so on. It says that Smootsi never made a skillful sailor. And I think this is really important because I don't know one player from Croatia who had a smooth sea in the in his development. So even if they get very easy way of developing, we should make it hard throughout our development plan. So this was macro level. Now meso level is the basically things that we can influence through our methodology, but I can already tell you what is happening in Croatia. So for example, this training play, uh, the kids are playing on the streets still comparing to Germany or the Western countries. Uh, futsal is very well developed, especially in our area here of Hajduk Split. And this was basically by the luck, but that's a topic for some other presentation. But it's a good thing for us. And the last thing is the available fields. So, for example, uh, I know in uh, not everywhere, probably in the USA, but a lot of times, you know, if you want to go play, you have to get in the club or you have to buy the pitch or something like this. In Croatia, because we, this was like in our ex country, Yugoslavia, basically it was the socialist country. So everything was free for the public and so on we remain this like culture of having like a free fields but this is also changing around the cities and i think we should try to make it keep it as it is so that kids can go and basically play all the time for free now i'll just all of this that i mentioned right now i'm going to try to put it in uh, in some kind of like a general picture so if we if we put on one side the structure and on another side, unstructured, or it would be like an environment where the, you can be creative. Because when it's very structured, it's hard to be creative or to think out of the box. So I, through my master thesis and this analysis, I, I like to compare it with the other countries. So when we talk about very structured country in the football, in every other everyday life, uh, Germany would be a very structured country. Like, like you drive the bicycle, you have to drive on the right side. If you don't drive on the right side, you get the ticket from the police. Yeah. Croatia is much far away from this. Like Brazil, it's completely far away. You can drive wherever you want, I think. Or at least what I saw when I was there two times. So historically, Croatia was always a little bit more to the right. Unstructured, you can like there was not so much law, so much rules and so on. But as we enter the European Union, we are moving towards the structure. There is education, there is universities, there is uh, clubs are getting more and more structured. Uh, so I believe why we as a country 
producing so many good players at the moment and why our clubs and uh, national teams are very good because we are at the moment in the perfect equilibrium between the structure and non-structure so we have creative players that actually has uh, enough structure to be successful because for example germany now is very you can see with the structure with the system they came to the winning the world cup in brazil but now they have a problem they are missing they, they have a less and less like a uh, creative players the players that can break something by themselves rather than team tactics while in another hand we have only 4 million people and we have both we have solid structure now but we have a uh, very good individuals i pull up brazil as well because i was there to to learn and uh, travel and so on when i was there basically everyday life was very non-structured the way people drive on the street was non-structured you you drive like left right uh, you don't know what's going on uh uh so i w i saw that like in everyday life there was missing a structure in the football i was so there was a lot of missing a structure but that's why they have a lot of creativity a lot of players who have to survive on their own the coaches that have to survive on their own uh, but you know, mm, uh, there there is on so many good individuals, there is not so many good uh, team uh, achievements. Yeah, I know that is probably now changing a bit, but uh, this is in my idea when I think, especially about the macro level, why Croatia is very successful with only four million people because we are at the moment in the perfect equilibrium. But in next ten years, we might actually have problems if we keep on moving towards the structure. So, uh, Andre, do we? This was like a little analysis about Croatia. Do we want to like comment something about this? Lucas, Lucas, have have uh, he raised his hand? So, uh, Lukas Cecinski. So, okay, I know him actually. From Poland. So, Lukas, uh, I have enabled your your microphone. If you want to ask something to Andro, feel free to do it. Okay, I guess Lukas is Lukas fall asleep. <laughs> If you want, we can continue and then we can ask later. Yeah, okay. Okay. Okay, so now about more about basically Hajduk split and our development plan. So we analyzed where we are, what we have, and now how we adapt so that we can get the best creative, skillful players. Yeah. So first of all, we have to know what we are as a club. So this is a little quote about Hajduk split from 1911. So basically club now has 110 years. Uh, it says the we fight against the power fool and we are protecting the weak. Yeah. So this is basically the three pillars that club is based on. It's a uh, heroism, humanity and the honesty. And these are the words that we want to that every person in the club have it and every kid that is taught by the coaches about this because then later on when they get, become a football players we're gonna get like a let's say full package yeah good human and a good player so this is creating a dna of the Hajduk split in our academy so when we are selecting the coaches they have to have these three uh, main uh, characteristics, human characteristics. And when we are selecting or identifying the players, we are identifying them by the potential or the talent. And the uh, coach's job is to teach them all of this. So when we talk about, in general, what coach has to have to work in the academy of the Hajduk split, he needs to believe in the development. He needs to believe in the development, like a, to be blind about development in a way, 
uh, that he believes that he can make out of the, his worst player in the team, he can make the he can uh, reach his maximum potential. Now, to be very general, what is coach teaching a kid? Basically, the coach's job is to keep the kid between the comfort zone and the panic zone, basically in the learning zone. And it's explained by this theoretical concept. Basically, coach should analyze the skills of each of his player and he should put the challenges in front of him that it's not going to board him, which would mean that his skills are too high for the challenges coach is putting in front of them, or anxiety that his skills of the players are too low comparing to the challenges that coach put in front of him. So coach should keep every player in, in this like a flow channel or, or development channel. And this is coach's job, very general. Yeah. Now, game style. Um, so basically, what would be the game style? Game style would be, if we put it in very general, uh, what is the focus on? So if we put it on the left side, the indirect or possession-based football, or on the right side, direct football or transition-based football. Uh, basically, what we want in the first team is some kind of the mix of both. Because we play Croatian League where we are basically going to be dominating and we're going to have to play possession. While when we play Europe, we're going to play against the better opponents probably at some point. So we have to be able to know how to play more direct or transition-based football. Now... When we talk about the academy, so our pro sector should be more leaned on the indirect or possession-based football to learn the tactics, obviously. When we talk about mid-sector, there is a tactics and technique still, and it should be more based on the possession-based football because obviously more ball you have, the more touches the player is going to have and develop the technique. And when we go to the fun sector or UA211, in my opinion, this should be universal in whole world, either in uh, California, either in uh, Brazil, either in Japan or in Croatia. We should all lean in the complete indirect possession-based football with the kids because this is the only way that kid. The more more time the kid touch the ball, the more the better the better he is, or more situations it happens. The B team is basically some kind of bridge between the academy and the first team and they should copy whatever first team principles are so as i mentioned the game style is coming from the b from the uh, first team and it's influencing less and less and basically no influence it has on the ua and this way we are creating the methodology that's very universal at the beginning it's basically should be the same everywhere and then we have the methodology in the pro sector, for example, that can be completely different than what Corinthians is doing in Brazil and a team as well. So now, more about the methodology. So this is how we we create like a theoretical framework of developing uh, developing individual player. Yeah. So this is the everywhere everyone in the in the world have these now principles of uh, four phases of football yeah the four phases attacking phase uh at defensive phase transition to attack transition to a defense yeah this is very universal now this is from the team point of view when we talk from the individual point of view we we use this and we have basically two uh possible situations in general Attack, so basically my team has a ball, or defense, opponent's team has a ball. Now, what it means attack on the ball? It means I am the player who has a ball. So my team have a ball, I am the person who has a ball. And there are only two things I can do at that moment. I can keep the ball for myself, or I can pass the ball to someone else or to the net. Or in attack, or my team has a ball, I can be the player who don't have a ball, but my colleague has it. So what I can do, I can dis do these two things. Same in defense, and I'm going to explain it in the details. So let's start with the situation when my team has a ball and I have it. So what I 
can do with keeping the ball or what coaches should work with the kids on it's on receiving protecting and dribbling the ball and now we can put here more things receiving with inside foot receiving with outside foot receiving with the chest receiving with the head and so on and so on yeah second general thing is what i can do is i can pass the ball or i can do the short pass long pass and i can shoot or i can pass the ball in the net okay so just to give you a picture this is what it means so to keep to work on the keeping the ball so the training i need to have at least one versus one situation and then i work on for example dribbling yeah how i'm going to dribble inside outside this way that way and so on or maybe the blue player is taking the ball away from the white player I have to teach the white player how to protect the ball. Yeah, He's not invading, but he's actually protecting. On the other hand, when we talk about passing, we can have situation 1v1 where this guy dribbles the guy out and then he pass or shoot in the net. Or usually when we talk about pass or short pass and long pass, we need to have at least situation 2v1 where I'm the player with the ball and I'm passing to my colleague. Now, when I'm when my team has a ball, but I don't have it, there is two situations: open for yourself or open for your teammates. So this is the situation. I'm this player, the white over here. I'm opening to this space with intention to receive this ball from my colleague. And then coach is working on space, time, and the positioning. On the other hand, open for a teammate would mean that I'm this player. I'm moving away from this space, but with intention not to receive the ball, but to clear this space so that this player can dribble in. Yeah? And then again, coach is working on space, time, and then why, the reason why you should do there. Now in defense, what it means on ball, it means that I'm the player who is closest to the opponent with the ball. So in this case, it would be this white player. So we need at least situation 1v1. And what I can do, I can try to take the ball or in the other way, when there is a 1v2, I can try to intercept the pass. Yeah, I'm the closest player to the ball. I'm trying to intercept the pass from opponent. And the last thing is in defense, if I'm not the first player next to the ball, if I'm the second, third, fourth, tenth, I can do two things. I can block the passing line or I can cover. So I'm this player. And I can block the passing line to the player I'm shielding. That's a, he don't have a ball as well. So I can work on space, time, and then risk. So the player has to understand the risk of doing this, that there might be a space to passing the ball behind his back. Covering is basically, I see that my teammate might lose one v one situation. So I'm coming to cover him up again, space, time, and then risk. If I come here, I'm leaving my player open. So now this was the theoretical framework that we are uh, doing throughout our academy in the different small sided games. So U8, U9, 1v1, 2v1 is the focus on, 1v2 for the top, top the players who has the ability to dribble on the extraordinary level. U2 and U11 is moving up and as we move up in the development plan is going all the way up to the 11 v 11 which is basically the professional football so the training should look like this this is the topic of the training so the games there is a pre-games and there is a warm-up after that there is a match maybe u8 is training 1v1 here but then at the end they're obviously going to play 4v4 5v5 6v6 yeah and then we are coming back to the theoretical framework yeah as i mentioned the goal of the coach is to keep the player in the development flow. Now, let's be more practical. Uh, let's say the coach is training U8 team and his topic today is uh, keeping the ball and uh, passing the ball, which would be receiving, protecting, dribbling and the shooting. Yeah, These are the subtopics. So let's say the player who is dribbling the ball He's in attack and playing against other opponent. He lose five out of five games. So basically he will be in the anxiety because the coach 
his skills are too low for the challenge that coach put in front of him or the opponent put in front of him. So what we can do in that situation, we can give him an easier opponent. We can give him a larger space. Maybe the problem is in the technique. Or we send him to the work on the isolated technique while the other players are working on the games. If the player is bored, so he wins five out of five games against this one, against the opponent, we should give him a harder opponent. We should give him smaller space. Or if he's still good enough, we should give him situation 1v2 or 1v3. If he's still dominating in that case, then we should send him to the year up generation. So this was just an example. So for example, we are categorizing the kids. I'm asking for my coaches every six months to categorize me the kids from number one to number, let's say, 20. And then when they're doing these games, he should pair up number one against number two, number three against number four, five against six, seven against eight. Why? Because maybe some kid who is number eight at the moment, he has a potential to reach to be number two or number one. But at the moment, he's maybe smaller. Maybe he's he came late in the football because his technique is not he's still perfect. So we should make sure that he's in the development flow, that he's not in the anxiety constantly, playing maybe eight against one, because then he's going to give up or burn out from the football. But maybe after one month, two months, the categorization changes, and then he moves to be number five. And then he is pairing up with the, another player. So this is basically the theoretical framework of all of this. And then I'm going to go into the clear plan. What do we do in each age category? So phase one, as I show here, fund sector, U8, U9, and U10, and U11. So here the focus is on static and dynamic technique. The demands are creating as many possible triangle structures. As I mentioned, development of static and dynamic technique development of individuality of the player and development of creativity. So when we talk about the game style in this age group, you should basically be on creating the match where the kids are going to be in situations 1v1 the most of the time or 2v1 in U8 and U9 game situations. Defense, we always want to get the ball quickly back because obviously we want to have ball possession which in this age group is more important than the result. Also, we have a problem, as I mentioned, less and less kids are playing on the street, in the parks, in the forest. So we have to add this to the training. So we have 30 minutes per week where the kids are playing other sports, uh, motor skill learning and so on. So U8 and U9, now this is the theoretical framework I was mentioning before, and now you can see see that actually it's missing opening for a teammate and it's missing the concept of covering and blocking the passing line. Why? Because for the kids that are eight or nine years old, these concepts are too hard to understand. Opening for a teammate would mean that he's doing something for his friend and at the moment they are only thinking about themselves. So what we have is the only situations when the ball is in his feet when the, he's opening, but he's opening for himself to receive the ball, or when he's closest to the opponent, who, so he's trying to take the ball or intercept or block the pass, passing line. So, as I mentioned, the games in this age groups are 1v1, 2v1, or 1v2. And this is how it, this is how it looks like. So I'm going to give you a few examples. This is a training of the U8. This is the warm-up. They are dribbling the ball. Each player has the ball. Basically, there is only a dynamic kind of cones around him. He should not touch anyone else. He should dribble through and so on. And then we move on to the 1v1 situations where everyone is trying to kick everyone else's ball. So you're trying to keep your ball for yourself. So this is basically keeping the ball and dribbling the ball. Yeah. And then we have again the kind of warm up sprints for what is waiting for them. And then we have the games. 1v1. 
So this is the main main part of the training. So the yellow team is uh, trying to dribble on the other side of the line. Orange is trying to take the ball and then score on the sides. Yeah, and then as many repetitions possible. Okay, just to give you some sense. <clears throat> this is the U8 generation. Okay, and then we move to the to the B version, 1v1. This time he has to dribble on the other side. The orange has to take the ball and then dribble or pass in the goal. And then at the end is the match time. So they play 4v4 and here the coach is coaching, but he's only coaching the situations 1v1, yeah? He can stop the game, tell the kids situation 1v1, but he should not coach in the group, in the group manner or in the group, the group tactics. Okay, so this was U9. Then we move on to U10 and U11. Here you can see that we are adding the covering because here we start with basically a 2v2 situations and 2v3. So now we have, when we work on topic that's defensive, there are the players that can basically start to understanding the concept of covering his own teammate, yeah? So here is the another training. The topic is 2v1. We skip the warm-up. Here is the pre-game, basically isolated, dribbling the cones and then passing to the teammate for what's going to be waiting them in the 2v1 situation. Now we're going to skip a little bit. And then we go to the 2v1 game. The two blue are trying to dribble the one orange out. There is always two options, pass or dribble. Yeah, the oranges at the moment are positioning bad, but coach is letting it be because it's just like kind of the warm up into the game. So they are always almost successful, the blue at the beginning. Yeah, and then coach, I believe, is going to now change a little bit. <coughs> So that they get like a more uh, uh, more push, yeah. Okay, now orange player is positioning a little bit better, and then the blue ones are always have decisions: dribble or pass. Yeah, good move, not too fast, and then orange took the ball. Uh, okay, and then we move on to the B version, and this time is more game realistic. Yeah, there is a shot, and then they play 2v1, two orange against one yellow, and then there is always decision and then execution. Yeah, there is two groups. The one is here with the coach, other one is on the left side. And he's again uh, separating them on the manner of the categorization. So the best eight are here and the second best eight are on the other side. Okay, last one and then we move on.
Okay. And then we go back again to, uh, to the game. So the game again. The game again is 4v4. This is a new nine training. And the coach is only, as I mentioned before, coaching the situations 2v1. That's the topic today, yeah? So it's going to happen, for example, in a few seconds. This is 2v2, yeah, okay. Mistake. And now there's going to be two blue against one red, okay? And then coach, if he's giving instruction, he's giving about this. He's going to let it be for a second so you see it. Okay, there's going to be, for example, now situations 2v1. That's a mistake. Okay, so for example, now this player has the, at the moment, situation 2v1, pass or dribble, he goes for dribbling and then shoot or, dri or pass and he goes for pass, then go through, but a good idea and the situation. Okay, uh, we move on, let's see how much time we have. Okay, enough. So this is, for example, for the fun sector, we train six times per week and then seventh week we are giving off because we believe it's too professional for the kids to constantly be in this regime of the trainings. We want to let, be, let them every seventh week to let them be free. Uh, so this is a weekly schedule. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday through Sunday. So training is on Monday, Tuesday is the training, Wednesday is free. Thursday is the deliberate play. I'm going to explain what it is. Friday is the training. Saturday is the game. And Sunday is free. So deliberate play would mean is basically uh, it's, it's a training, but it's training around the city. And it's not in our complex where we're trying to put kids outside of this professional environment. So they go and they see actually the 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 pitches around the city that are free to use. And the coach only comes there, he brings the ball, cones, and then kids are creating the training by themselves. We do this once a week. And this is, for example, some kind of games that kids are playing on their own. Here, maybe they play 2v2, one goalkeeper, pulling around, and they can try here whatever they want without coach being stopping the game, being commenting, you should do this, you should not do this, because we want them to be creative, to find out other ways and to make mistakes. It doesn't matter in this age. Okay, this is just the examples. This is how it like. Yeah, so this team here is playing 2v2 plus one joker against the goalkeeper. Uh, here, these ones are playing some kind of game where they have to pass. One has to receive in the box and then other one has to pass it. If they miss, the other team has to get the point, yeah? These guys are hitting the ball of the wall. It has to be from the first touch. Whoever makes mistakes, lose the match. And then here they play against uh, 2v2 on the other side. At the end, they obviously play some kind of match by themselves, whatever they agree. In the winter, because we cannot be outside, uh, we do the same thing. But once per week, we play futsal. Why futsal? And this is now very important. I, I, I would not say futsal, but more like a four plus one game. So when we play five plus one, basically, we have a problem in these age groups. And the problem is that this kid, as we mentioned, we want to create situation one v one or two v one. And we want to have the kid to be creative, to be individual, which means to dribble a lot. Uh, if we have the players in the middle, there is no space to dribble to the right side. But there is only situation to dribble down the flank. 
what happens, not in our academy, but in the other smaller clubs, they usually put the biggest two guys over here, usually not the guys who are dribblers. They put maybe dribblers up top, and then these two big guys usually has the bigger steps. They just dribble down the flank. They push the ball and go. And this is not something that we want. Same thing with the passing. You cannot pass the ball here. It's too far away for the kids. You cannot pass the ball in the middle. There is a player on his back. If he takes him a ball, he scores, and then coach is pissed and put the, these kids on the bench. We don't want this. We don't want these situations to occur. What, what happens, basically, he can only pass down the flank, and that's it's not the game that we want to create. What happening with the four plus one or the futsal is that we always have a space in the middle. So basically, there is always a decision to go right or left. And then again, to pass right or left, to go right or left and to dribble or the situations one, we want, two, we want. Same thing with the passing. There is always a free space. And when there is a free space, you can actually use this for identification. So in this age, Usually, you know, there is a many difference between the kids who has better technique, who is stronger, faster, and so on. The ones who understand the concept of the space and the time, I, without coach being telling them, I believe these are the ones that on the long run are going to be found as the, as a, you can say, the most talented or the, the, has the huge potential. Because if they know where to move, just by sensing the situations, this is what the modern football is asking from them. Uh, that's why we create like a futsal tournaments with the futsal clubs in our region. Uh, there is also education part, and this is how it looks like. And I'm going to give you now an example why I believe four plus one is top. This is 15 seconds of one of the match. And you can see that every white player touched the ball and basically every second there was situation or a dribbling. Okay, situation, dribble, dribble, dribble. Defense, pass, pass, great pass, shot, post. So this guy, this game was 20 minutes. This was 15 seconds. The white team is obviously high look split. And this game actually finished, I think, 1-1 or something like this. And the other team went through on the penalties. What is also a very important thing, you can see these four guys, they are coming from the local team. These two guys already trained a little bit with us, and they are good enough. These two other guys, they couldn't follow, but they were all right. And then there was a solid goalkeeper. They could play 4v4 against our team that has basically the best players out of the region. Okay, this time they won. Usually the game would be 3-1 for us. But the kids won't be beaten 10-0. So they would still have the motivation to go on and train in these little villages or little cities around Split. But the problem with the bigger... Uh, game relations like five plus one or six plus one in each age groups is that we have the six players that are best they have maybe one or two that are good they have a good potential but four are not and then we beat them six zero after that these two guys that are good for example this one and this one they are giving up in the psychological way because they believe that they are less worth than the high look split kids and this is why I also believe the futsal is great because in futsal you cannot hide. You can see the individual quality. And this is, I think, very important. So I'm going to mention again why I believe this four plus one is great because when we talk about five plus one, I believe we are developing the positional positions or positional game. And the positional positions, in the, at, the, at least at the moment in the football, are these. These guys are very positional. These guys are very positional. These guys, okay, a little bit less, but this is the situation. What we need to find in this fund sector is the guys who are talented or has a potential to make situations four plus one and to be creative. Why? Because we need the guys up top who are creative. They are making the uh, difference and they are making the value tomorrow. I'm going to give you a few scientific papers that actually prove this. So, Memert from my university, 
very good, very interesting professor, and he's uh, doing a lot of studies on creativity. He talked a lot about this, and he found out that on last two Euro Cups and the World Cup, the teams that had uh, more creative moves in the three movements before scoring the goals, they actually came to the semi-finals of the of these competitions, which makes sense. And let me let me try to logically explain. So every team today in the world can bring the ball from their half to last 30 meters from the goal. But then other teams, obviously opponents now playing very systematic defense. What it makes difference is the player like Neymar, like Modric, like I don't know, you can tell me, uh, Aguero. The guys who actually make something out of the box. They make a move that you as a coach cannot analyze and you cannot kind of organize your team to stop this. This is something that comes from them, their inspiration. For example, Iceland, they don't have creative players. So what they need to do, they need to throw the throw-ins from here or from here inside the box and try to jump and score the goal. That's not very creative, but that's the only way they can go further in the competition. And now we know that obviously the guys who make creative moves, they make something that makes the team scoring the goal are much more worth on the market. And this is obviously what I was mentioning before. We have to keep this environment that's creating the, uh, the, the creative players. Now, the biggest question for the academies is how the creativity is developed. It's another paper from Memert that it says that players who were found as highly creative and they were doing this research in the on the German internationals Bundesliga one two three players they spent two times more hours in street football or deliberate play before the 14 years old what this means deliberate play means or street football basically the situation or the environment where the kids are not coached but they are doing or creating the game by itself so now when you go back and you when I was mentioning this deliberate training, it's we are trying to create a situation where the kids can be free to think and to make mistakes and to risk and to risk and to risk because tomorrow when they are 20, when they repeat something so many times, even if it's a risky, even if the situation is one versus three, they're going to be more skillful and they're going to be more uh, more able to think out of the box. Okay, so I mentioned you, we have a problem with this, yeah? We have a problem that 20 years or 10 years ago, the mom was taking us home to dinner and we were all day with the ball and today they are trying to take us out. Now, I mentioned to you how we're trying to fight this trend in the society through our academy and through our uh, kind of uh, designed development plan. Also, you know, a lot of times we are talking. Oh, every kid has the, every kid has the, every kid has the basically, uh, every kid has the basically the, uh, how to say this, the phone, yeah. And we are so pissed. Okay, they have a phone. We cannot do anything. Blah blah blah. But maybe we can use these phones to approach them and to talk about and motivate them to go outside and play on the street. So this is a little video that we created in our academy and it can be found on the YouTube that's basically talking that every kid in order to become a football player in Hajduk Split they should go through these steps. So first step street street uh, yards or street uh, fields. And then basically they can find about 100 games on the 
on the YouTube where they can go with the friends on the street and just play it by or just being by themselves. Okay, mid sector, I'm going to go quickly through this and then we're going to stop and then go to identification. So, demands here we are adding the diamonds and triangle game structure, specific and functional technique, development of individual and group tactics. And we base the system on 1433 three, front or low forward attack. We have a continuous attack and creativity in creation, defense aggressive with attention to return the ball possession. Possession is still important for development of the group dynamics. So we are basing the system. So as you see, these four players are always remain the same. Defensive mid, two offensive mid, sometimes, okay, the coach can pull down another defensive mid. But up top is from generation to generation. Why? Maybe we have in this generation, we have only 4 million people. We cannot choose how we want our number nine to look like. Maybe in this generation we have target man, the guy who play very well with the back to the goal. So we're going to play formation like this. Or maybe we have very good number offensive uh, midfielder who is very creative. So we have him here and then we have two power forwards. So we play it like this. So this is what the coach can decide on his own when he's analyzing his players. Why? Because we believe that these kids are we cannot say born but they are the ones that they are creative they're they're special they, they 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 are different yeah if they think out of the box they are different so we have to adapt the game so that uh we take the potential out of them on the most okay so in this mid sector very important the kids are growing up we have to motivate them by hope of winning rather than fear of loss, which means we are always trying to put some kind of award rather than the punishment. So this is a, one of the examples that each category of U12 to U15 has to use on every basically training. The game that we finish, I mentioned the match, uh, is that uh, it's ending up with some kind of game. You saw it before 4v4 so if they play 4v4 we put a list of all the players four players that won the match they get the points four players that didn't won the match they don't get the points and then after six months i get this table from the coaches and i can see which player is winning the most which player is losing the most it's very interesting because you can see you can first like you're developing this winning mentality and then you're developing something like it's still soft, but the feeling that if you are first on, in the in the in the in the ranking, the other players are trying to chase you, and you have to you have to challenge yourself to keep yourself on the first place. Or maybe you're last, and then you're afraid that you're going to remain the last, and you have to challenge yourself to push up. So this way, we create the environment that's very very strong on the training, very very competitive, and also it gives the kids the feeling what's going to be waiting for them in the professional football as a team. Yeah. Usually Hajduk is always in the first, second or third place. So, and usually the players who are first, second or third has the chance to end up in the first team. So they are, they're going to be getting this feeling like, Oh, for example, Dinamo Zagreb is chasing us. We have to remain the first place. This won't take them out of the comfort zone, but they're going to be having this already previously. So this is another version. Why we do this also is because the good coach doesn't have to show a need to win, but his players must. So when me or the academy director comes for the game to watch, I don't want to see my coach screaming around, jumping and so on in this age categories. I want If he's sitting on the bench and his players are giving 100%, then I know that he did a good work throughout the week. Okay, U12, U13, we are adding in theoretical framework all these things now. They are able to understand them. Games are going bigger and bigger. Team tactics is not that big in U12. Individual tactics is something what we are working on the most. And then group tactics. As we move up, the team tactics and group tactics are getting to be more and more important. This is just a video again 
of the match of U12, I believe, or U13. They play 4v4, and now depends on what the topic was. The coach is again coaching either 3v2 situations or maybe even 3v3. And then we have a lot of repetition. And then after that, on the left side, these are the best eight, and this is the second best eight. Okay, U14, U15, same thing, 4v4, and then team tactics in U15s are getting bigger and bigger, 25%, and group tactics 50%, and then when we enter the pro sector, basically, it's all about the team tactics. So, this is basically the development plan. Andre, maybe we can discuss it now, and then I'm going to just go through quickly through the identification process. What do you think? You want to, to have discussions? At the moment, we only have uh, one question. OK, sure. Uh, I don't know if everyone is, is being shy or something like that. But um, if you want to continue uh, and leave it the questions at the end, it's OK, or the other way around? It's Whatever. Uh, here is someone raised the hand, I guess. Yeah. I mean, we can so, we can do it now. I have yeah? maybe okay. ten more minutes, the max. Okay. Okay. So, just a second. Okay. So, uh, Tony, Tony, if you want, if you want yes, to ask the question to to Andrew, please. Yes. Thank you for the opportunity. I'll be quick. I just have a question about the fun section, uh, the quick one. Uh, what is your opinion about the position of the players? Is it smart for that young kids to, uh, to for the coach to decide which position he, ha he he should play, or that is something that should happen in U12 or U U14? If you understand can, me, thank can you. you. Yeah, can you can you rephrase one more question? You talk about the phase one, yeah. Yeah, the fun section. Uh, okay. So, is it smart for a player, for example, seven, eight years old, to choose? Okay, you are, you are, I don't know, you are forward, or should no, every no. every uh, child play every position in that young uh, age? So, first of all, I uh, at the moment, for example, our leagues are six plus one. So there is six players on the pitch, and usually you have the guys who are more back and guys who are more front. I believe this is completely wrong. I think we should play four plus one games. And when you have four plus four players, the game is just pushing you to always switch. And there is no forwards, no defenders. They are moving everywhere around. So basically, you don't have a positions like futsal. You know, when you watch futsal, the guys are just interchanging all the time. Okay, we don't have this environment yet, but. For example, if you have six plus one, I would change all the kids around, even the goalkeepers. Switch up. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have here a question um, in the Q&A section. Um, it's an a anonymous participant. He didn't uh, write it down his name. So uh, I will ask it to you, Andrew. Um, is asking, he or she asking, uh, until the U11, the kids will never play bigger matches in training than 4v4? No. Uh, so U8, U9, I, if, I, if I'm, I'm trying to push this in our regional associations, we should play 4 plus 1 uh, leagues. And then in this way, we would not train more than this age uh, this uh, re uh, game relation situations. At the moment, we are playing six plus one. So I'm not telling my coaches, no, you cannot do six plus one on the training, but never in the games. Games should be one v one, two v one. When you go to the match, play four v four. But okay, if you're preparing for some tournament, play six plus one. If the tournament is going to be six plus one, the kids has to you know understand the concept and everything. But ideally. U8, U9, 4v4, not more than this, even less, maybe 3v3. U10, U11, 
I would move up the game to five plus one, maybe six plus one, but that's max, in my opinion, because this way you get more repetition, more touches on the ball, more dribbling, more everything, and this is what these kids need. They don't need, they don't need like uh, you know we're gonna play like Guardiola, tiki taka, tiki taka, and then. Uh, you know, the forward is really good. He gets the ball much more time than the left guy. And then left guy is not developing. This guy is developing more. And you actually don't know who has more potential. Whoever tells you that in nine years old, he can find the potential and he knows, I think he's wrong. So that's my opinion. Okay, so uh, we have here um, two questions from Steep. Uh, Steep, do you want to probably, I will... Uh... Okay. Give you the I chance can... to, to ask to ask to Andrew. Okay. If you want. Yes, I will. Thank you very much, Andrew. So You're from welcome. Mr. Fistonich, uh, I have two questions. Uh, my first question is uh, regarding the puberty of a young players when they are entering the puberty. So uh, I was uh, born and raised in Split and I saw a lot of talented young players uh, losing interest in football when the puberty starts and they're going through the puberty to the girls and other stuff. So my question is, are you tackling this problem in the academy right now? And if so, how? And my second question is uh, to towards the players' uh, physical abilities. So in the last couple of years, we have seen a couple of players being uh, uh, physically dominant in the younger generations. But when they, when they transition to B team or the first team, they still rely on the being physical dominant. And there's some of their technical skills or some other sk skills are lacking. So can you elaborate why what, what's happening these processes? Why are these players not maybe developing more technically in younger generations? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Stipe. Uh, okay, I go with the first one. So you are right. A lot of kids lose the interest, and I, I, I see this as a much bigger problem than puberty. I, I don't think it's, you know, puberty. You mentioned right. The girls are coming. The going out is coming. Every, every uh, other new things are coming that are interesting. Yeah, the football is not the most interesting at the moment, but it's up to us as a club and as a coaches to create the environment where the kid likes to come. I believe, and I was a kid raised in this area as well, that we didn't have the top top pedagogists in the coaching uh, like this world. Maybe we had a good coaches. I don't know this, but uh, the we have to create environment where the kid feels I want to come there tomorrow. I want that more than. I don't know, go and drink a beer. As long as you create this, then they won't burn out or lose the interest in football. But if we have a coach who's going to be screaming on me from the side line, if I make a mistake, I'd rather go with my girlfriend to walk on the, uh, in the park. So I think, in my opinion, this was the, this was and it is still a problem in Croatia. It's getting better. The coaches are getting more and more educated, better and better uh, level of pedagogy. And uh, I think it's getting better, but we are still far, far away from, for example, from the Germany or whatsoever. Uh, and then this is later on uh, happening that, for example, we don't have only three divisions or four divisions in our region, while in Germany you have 12 or 13 because even the amateurs don't want to play football anymore because the environment is not like, okay, I want to come here, play football and go have a drink and go home. But it's like, oh, I have to win. I have to this. I have stress already on the work. And then people just lose the interest in the football. Why? Let me go play darts or play chess or play cards with my friends where I'm going to laugh instead of someone is going to be screaming on me from the sideline. So I think that's, uh, in my opinion, the answer on the first question. The second one, uh, you know, this was this is the perspective of how the kids were identified before, yeah? As everywhere, I think, in the world, we were identifying the guys who were the best at U12 and they are scoring the most goals. And then we started changing this mindset. 
okay we want to find the guys who are actually potentially very good so usually the smaller kids got more and more opportunities because they you could see the better skills in them better uh, game understanding better decision making and so on so uh, yeah maybe i can i can think about it what you who you're referring to like top prospects and then later on in the b team not really uh, so why this happened i think i explained in this fun sector i think it starts all from that we play six plus one one guy is dominating he's maybe shooting from 10 meters or 20 meters out he's scoring the goals we think he's good but this is not he's just at the moment able to do that and this is not when they come 18 everyone is going to be able to do that we have to see when they are eight nine we have to put the situations three v three four v four max or one v one and then we see who is actually good and then we see when this biology comes on the same when they are 15, 16, 17, 18, then we see who has the better decision making, who has a better agility, skills, and so on. So I hope this this was answered. Uh, okay, so uh, we have uh, three more questions or two attendees with three questions. Uh, we have one from David, David Kowalski. Okay. Uh, someone we Big don't friend. know. <laughs> yes yes okay. uh, so uh, david um i don't know if he wants to to do the the question himself but i will try to david please hello, hello. ask uh, your question uh please ask it to andrew Oh, good, good, good to see you, Andrew and Andre, and um, fantastic presentation. And I just want to find out, Andrew, how, how do you um, get uh, assess uh, players' creative, uh, creativeness? And um, do you kind sure. of rate it? Do you have like assessment program or do you kind of uh, uh, have some, some, some criteria in, uh, in place? Yep. Uh, at the moment, we don't have nothing that's more than the subjective opinion of the coaches. Uh, I mentioned the, those two uh, scientific work. They are very subjective as well. So what they basically did, they took the UEFA pro coaches. They give them like uh, different players. They were looking their uh, movements, decisions and so on. And then the coaches would rank. Yeah, very creative, not creative and so on. Uh, basically, the creativity is explained as... Uh, thinking out of the box or basically if you have 10 situations that are very similar and the uh, nine guys decide or eight guys decide very similar in that situation and these two other guys decide completely different than each other those two guys would be more creative yeah they would do something that's that's not expected by the mass so this, this is this was basically the scientific work that they the member did, but in our club we don't have something that's more than subjective opinion at the moment. Is that only with regards to football, or is this uh, also with regards to have uh, different um, tasks and, and activities? Do you uh, uh, observe in the players in terms of their creativeness? No, just I mean just the football in our in our club because it's all about football. But I know these uh, papers came out from some like uh, school work. Yeah? For example, a lot of times they're comparing the different societies. So, for example, Chinese society or a Asian society is very, uh, how to say this, group orientated or non-individualistic. Like there, no one wants to look different from other. While if you go to America, everyone, you know, there is American dream. You want to be different you want to create something new and so on so they were looking the school systems and then they would give the kids okay uh make this project make sure there is the olive tree or something and then they would make the pictures you know and then from the pictures you will get it, get it who made something different or who just follow the rules of things like that so uh, this is how it's, it's still very subjective uh, rankings but I obviously it's creativity. It would be very hard to. I don't know how they're gonna make it qualitative. Science is moving further and further. One day maybe, but at the moment not. Okay. Thank you very much, Andrew. Yeah. Thank you, David.
Okay, uh, uh, Andre, maybe let's finish no. the identification and then we can answer all of this okay. and discuss with Bruno okay. and, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, we have uh, here two questions, but uh, we can leave it for the for the end. Okay, uh, and uh, let's move move forward. Okay, so I'm gonna just basically uh, show. Okay, so this is what our club has as the identification process. Uh, country or the national teams, they have like their own structure where they did identifying the players from uh, 13 years old and up through the regional and then uh, national associations. Uh, our club basically has ID selections, international seminars and the commercial camps. So ID selection, this is, this is a split. This is the stadium of our club. This is our region. And this is what we basically have. We basically, uh, we basically have the, this, uh, <clears throat> these seven points around our region that are uh, in the fall, we are creating the ID games. So every kid U8 to U11 uh, from the clubs that are this area, so, for example, area number one, Dubrovnik, we create a game over there in our partner club. Every other club brings their best kids, and then our coaches are watching the games, and they are kind of listing everyone down. And then we do it here, and then here, and then here, and then here, and then we put all this in the database. So we try to get every single kid in this area that's walking with the ball to have it in our database. And then in spring, we are creating for the each location a game. This, the best kids from each location come and they play the match against our teams, U8, U9, U10, U11. Actually, the, the, the guys who are on the bench or second best eight. And then we again evaluate, reevaluate our kids, reevaluate those kids, how good they are, because the perception in football is always a tricky thing. And then at the end, there is like a all-star game or the best kids from all these areas playing against the best team of our U8 or U9 or U10 and so on. And this way, we get one year process where we are writing down the kids, identifying them and then re-evaluating them. And then if we see that, for example, some kid has some kind of potential, but we don't want to take him away when he's nine years old, we call this partner club and we tell them, okay, guys, take this kid in your club from this other local small team, work with him on this, on that, and he's going to come with us, for example, on the tournament in Poland when David when David Kowalski is uh, creating the, the, the tournament for the kids. So this way, we have this process for four years, and then we believe when U12 comes, we know everyone who are walking around this area, and then we can create the second selection yeah, or the best selection. After U12, we are going to identifying the players all around Croatia. So this is the map of Croatia. Here is the Bosnia. We have on each of these plays a partner club that is giving us informations that we can send the kids when we see some kids on the tournament to that club. They are developed over there. And then we take these kids between maybe 14, 15 years old. We bring them to split if they are top talents. Very important thing. This is we try to implement in our club as well. Uh, you know, when we speak everywhere around the world, when we speak about talent potential, I feel like a lot of times we talk about different things. So when we speak in our club about talent potential, I'm trying to create like a wording that everyone is going to be on the same page when we talk. So if I'm going to talk about talent, in my opinion, not my opinion, but throughout reading all the scientific works and so on, the talent would be, or first of all, there is a quality. Yeah. Let's say we have a player A and player B. They are both U12 and both, let's say, born in January. Let's say there is a quality that we rank from 0 to 10. Yeah. So the kid A... When he's U12, his quality is 5, and kid B, quality is 3. This is the current quality. It means basically nothing. 
in my opinion yeah now talent would be number of training or number of time that this kid needed in the training environment in order to get to the point of having the quality level of five yeah so maybe this kid started uh, to train when he was u8 so he is already here maybe this kid also started u8 and he's here so this guy would be more talented than this guy because he's absorbing the the information's better he's learning quicker and so on and this would be talent in my opinion yeah uh now potential in my opinion is something completely different because potential of the player b can be much bigger than player a we don't know this and this is something that uh it's you know when you have a scout who can recognize this kind of potential you know you should pay him a lot or the coach and so on and this is the, basically the 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 interesting part of working in the football it's how to recognize the kid who is u12 what is going to be when he is in 18 years old maybe this player b has potential here so his potential to reach the maximum six of the quality let's say in the speed okay speed we can actually measure and we can say okay it can get better by maybe five percent or less but when we talk about football about decision making there is so much things that influence it maybe this kid basically started to train where he was 10 so he had less training time than this kid so when they come to the same time of training time maybe he's going to be moving up more so he's going to be talented and his potential might be bigger so it's this is very very hard you know there is the rule of 10000 hours to basically uh master some kind of skill so to recognize when both of these players have 10000 hours where they going to be in the quality is the potential and this is something that we should be looking for in the kids talent is something that coaches can look on the pitch when they are training the kids how quickly he's adapting to the different challenges or the scenarios and so on so uh when we identifying we use these motoric functional measurements we can measure this even technique we can measure today these are the things that are hard to measure tactics or decision making quality decision making speed ability to change decision and mental characteristics ability to learn and the teamwork when we talk when we go and to look the games or the tournaments and we're looking we're trying to identify the players very important and this is now the mid sector but we can talk about fun as well a little bit we should not look for the perfect player we should look for potentially perfect player and then we throw out two questions to ourselves what we can develop in this player what we can't develop yeah the speed especially the the starting speed is something that we cannot really develop we can change five percent ten percent maybe max but that's it what we can develop technique tactic decision making understanding and so on now we have to analyze what he has and what he doesn't have so here is one like a practical uh situation let's say when i go to watch the game first thing what is the most obvious in the kid that plays in this local team ignore because maybe he's fat and then you have first impression he's fat he cannot play in high split how he's going to be playing in high split but he's fat this is something we can develop he can lose the weight we have a nutritionist we have a fitness coaches we have so on after you move this he's fat then go and take a look because the first thing thing that is most obvious usually makes you uh blind on the other skills i like to we like to joke and compare this to the when you go to the nightclub you know you first see the most beautiful looking girl but after that first night you're looking actually how smart she is how funny she is and all of these things but maybe it's already too late so try to avoid that she is the most beautiful one 
and try to try to look what she actually has to offer rather than that because on the long term this is what you need what is her potential so same thing most obvious is something we base decision on what do you see now it can be also most obvious something positive he's very fast but then he's very fast okay we need him in high loop split no maybe his decision making is terrible maybe his agility is bad so we have to question it the other skills as well also when you go to look the local teams very important what minute is so amateur players can play as long as professionals even in this age group so his potential is in first 15 to 30 minutes after that don't judge him on performance after that moment and there is international camps or seminars we are doing it around the world where there is a lot of croats emigrating so usa canada australia this is what we are doing it at the moment for example uh christian pulisic yeah now one of the best players from america his grandpa is croatian his last name is croatian he has a croatian passport so i know for example i was at that moment working for dinamo zagreb and uh, i know that he was uh, identified through some kind of camps in america and he came for a tryout in zagreb so now it's a player of 70 million euro so we still look for the croats around the world and we try to we try to attract them uh all of this goes to one big database and then we have other processes like a testing and so on that that is giving us more objective opinion about about the players so uh andre i will end up with this i think we are already far away let me see How 15 minutes I... sorry 15 minutes just 15, 15 minutes. minutes yeah okay <laughs> uh no, no problem. i don't know how to cut the uh, okay just a moment uh, I've done okay it. you did it i've done it for you yeah perfect thank you okay i think we can now start with okay. the questions um the yeah we have uh, here a couple a couple more questions uh before uh, starting the discussion um we have here Vyakoslav with his uh, hand raised. I will let him talk with you. Okay, Vyakoslav from Arsenal, I think. Yeah. I think I, we connected through the social media. Okay. So. Hello, Vyakoslav. It's not. Not responding. Just a second, yeah. Can you hear okay. me now? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andro. Really good presentation. Thank you for accepting my invitation to be part of this. Uh, yeah, I, I do have a one question. Uh, obviously, from my experience, uh, I'm uh, related with the rondos and positional and uh, possession activities. So, just simple question. Uh, I believe you do you do it in in high loop split as well. Obviously, your presentation was focused more on one v one and two v one for uh, youth developing youth players, which I agree th these are the most important. But uh, do you and obviously, as I said, you do probably. And when do you start implementing rondos and and positional play activities? And could you tell us a little bit more about that? How how that would look in uh, academy of high loop? Yeah. And that would be thank you. Okay, thank you, Ekslav. Uh, I'll tell you like straightforward, we don't go that much into details to uh, structure our coaches to tell them when to start with Rondo, when to not start with the Rondo. Uh, I think, you know, you probably worked in Croatia previously and uh, I believe we have uh, many good coaches, uh, good education and uh, we as a Hajduk split, we can attract the best guys they should be able first as i mentioned to recognize or to analyze the skills of the particular player and to put challenges on him so uh, it's up to the each coach to recognize maybe we do rondo with u8 or u9 but is that rondo going to be 
let's say five against one is that rondo going to be three against one how big that rondo is going to be how small that rondo is going to be it's up to the coach to create the environment and up it's up to me and the academy director to come watch the training and if we see that one kid is in anxiety and is losing all the time and he cannot pass the ball right then he don't need this kind of rondo maybe he needs hitting the ball of the wall in high split usually this doesn't happen but in some other smaller academies would so it's up to you to get the kids or to match up the kids that are on the similar level so that they are all in this development flow and that they are progressing and getting better every day and if you obviously you need to you need to have the coaching experience for this in order to recognize the kid to analyze the kid and the emotional intelligence if the kid is developing they can do rondo all day if this is making them developing or they can do something else not all day obviously i was mentioning the small sided games and so on but rondo would be for the pre games or even maybe for the warm ups in some context but it's up to the coach to decide when and what what is yeah I think Andre, we can, or Vyakoslav, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. Yeah, I'm happy with the answer. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we have here a couple more questions, but uh, what we, what will I do is um, to the attendees that ask the questions, uh, I will send it through Andro, and then Andro, if if it's okay with you, you can answer you can answer them. Sure. These sure. questions, okay. Uh, just to spare spare time for for our discussion with Gustavo sure. and Bruno, okay. So uh, I will send it send it to you after, okay. And then you can uh, you can answer this these questions. Thank you, everyone that uh, participates uh, in the discussion. Um, we will start now the discussion with uh, with the Andro, Gustavo, and Bruno, okay. So. Okay, so uh, quick quick words from from Gustavo and Bruno about uh, Andrew's presentation. Uh, for me, it was uh, was a top quality because uh, I already knew Andrew and I already knew his work, so uh, it was not a surprise for me. But uh, it's always always uh, great to see a presentation like this and uh, with a lot of details that uh, sometimes sometimes. Uh, someone from a club don't want to to show to the to the general public because there's a couple of things that that um, is uh, I do split DNA and in, in their methodology. But uh, let me congratulate you, Andrew, Andre, Andrew, about this um, this presentation. Top top quality. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Just uh, just want to congratulate Andrew. I think it was. Very nice, you know, to be listening for almost one hour and a half. And just to also tell you a little bit about myself, Andrew, you know, I'm, uh, I'm from Brazil, right? And uh, I, I worked for the Brazil national team for 10 years. Um, I was also, you know, I was responsible for the youth recruitment for the Brazil youth national teams. I was academy manager for the youth national teams. I was academy director for Fluminense. And Fluminense, you've been in Brazil. Fluminense has one of the top academies in Brazil and in the world. Many top players came through the pipeline, so it was pretty good to. I've been to Croatia before, you know. I've been to a lot of countries with the youth national teams from Brazil. So when I came to America six years ago, it was very good to understand also the reality we had in Brazil, the reality we have in Africa that I've been in, the reality we have in Europe, you know. And we also have a country close to us in, in South America called Uruguay, that's pretty similar to what Croatia does very yeah. small country yeah. with an amazing culture you know we're talking about size wise because you know everybody talks about brazil about argentina and about uh, of course about france you know england you know those called germany we we have like a centenary culture like croatia and also and, uh, and also uruguay but what these countries do it's just unbelievable and understanding what you guys are doing in croatia it's it's very nice this is why I learned one thing pretty early. There is no right and wrong. 
in this game and in this business, right? It's just on how you make things work. And that's why I'm gonna also talk a little bit on understanding how things work outside and a little bit of how we work inside MLS, inside America. Cause I know a lot of people, it's pretty, um, it's not a surprise for me cause I, I came to America 25 years ago before I went back to Brazil. I play here, I play college soccer here. So I knew MLS and how America needs to organize that the things are gonna work. And the, you know, in MLS, what's gonna grow? That was my insight 25 years ago when MLS started. And this was the main reason why I left Brazil. I left, you know, I left everything I had built in Brazil to participate in this growing that we're having inside the United States right now. And it's gonna be pretty nice to discuss with you guys a little bit on the next, you know, half an hour, a little bit of the work you will also do inside our club. Sure. Sure, perfect. Uh, Bruno, I, I I'll just uh, respond. Uh, great, great CV and uh, ending up from Brazil back to USA and earthquakes that uh, I, I basically know the Bay Area really well and the situation there. It's, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a completely different environment than European football or Brazilian. Also just like a structure of the of the football clubs yeah it's a, like a little academies or little for-profit clubs or non-profit clubs uh, one league uh, norcal carl north so many different things and then you have like an mls team that should actually grow something out of all of that and then this high school football college football uh, soccer sorry and uh uh, but huge potential. I remember when I was there, huge, huge potential. And uh, more, I remember it was structure wise that soccer was just developing. And uh, I, I, I don't assume that I left from there 2014, that uh, it developed a lot, uh, exactly <clears throat> six years from uh, you probably arrived and I left. So, yeah, looking forward to it as well. Andrew, congratulations again for the, the presentation. Very rich. Uh, I learned a lot watching this. And I'm sorry also for your bad experience with traffic in Brazil. I know it's for me. <laughs> in a Friday before Carnival, Bruno, uh, we, we were through the marginal Tietê. So it's, I know it's a bad experience, but you are right about, about that. Uh, but uh, it was very rich to to watch and see how the reality goes closely, uh, and we don't need to go until Uruguay. Uh, for those who doesn't know about uh, Brazil, Corinthians, the, uh, where I work here, is based in the biggest city of uh, of Brazil. It's about uh, 20 21 million uh, people living in. But only in where Corinthians is placed is in the east side of the city. And only in the east side of the city that's very identified with the club, we have 4 million people living in, plus cities are around. So uh, it it's, was uh, good uh, to learn. And we know that the importance of dominating the region first before going out for scouting. Uh, because these these guys they have more identity with the culture of the club and 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 what it means to be part of this kind of club and uh, as long as process is is very important uh, to develop a talent the culture involved in in this process and, and how to create this culture is very important so like in under 17 here we have 50% uh, of these guys coming from this east side region. And then we have 25% of other guys coming from the state of Sao Paulo. That's also identification. And uh, 20, the other 25, okay, it comes from all around Brazil. That is, everybody knows it's uh, 200 million people, people uh, place and, uh, Thank you for the presentation and also I'd like to I, I'd like to know 
uh, because futsal here is also very important. And, and since the 90s, uh, it's gained more and more space because, as you said, we are lost. We are losing places for kids to play and lost. And, and so uh, the greatest Brazilian players, actually, they are coming from futsal in the beginning. And uh, so we have this going on here that's mixture. They play futsal and play football at the same time. And uh, sometimes, as you said, we, ha we don't have full control of this activity. But in the end of the day, this will bring uh, good things for them. Yeah, I would uh, just to give to give the perception. I was presenting all of this like it was uh, found in uh, Hajduk Split. I'll be honest, uh, straight on. Uh, so when I when I visited uh, Brazil, I actually visited Corinthians, and that's how I met Gustavo on a rainy day on the grass. And uh, at the same time, I actually first went to meet Eduardo, I, I forget his name. He's like a coordinator of futsal in Corinthians, which is basically, you know, for the, for the attendees, the Brazilian clubs are like uh, Portuguese clubs, like you have club and then you have football, futsal, basketball, la, 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 other sports, right? Uh, and then... I, I went to speak with the guy and then I first watched the futsal trainings and there was the little kids. Yeah, you eight, you nine, you 10, you 11. They trained. It was amazing. I saw so many um, skillful kids, absolutely crazy. And then I, I would like, I stepped out to watch U13 uh, football team and some of the kids were the same. They trained in the night futsal and they trained at afternoon, they trained football. And I was like, wow, this is, uh, I think I spoke with Gustavo about this and the Eduardo. Uh, and then they explained me, I remember that kids usually until U10, they play basically all the time futsal and tournaments and everything like this. And then from U10, U11 until U15, they play both. And then U15, they have to decide, yeah, this way or that way. Usually it's always football and then coming back to futsal. And for me, this was like very interesting because our region in Croatia, the one that I showed you, had seven out of 10 first division futsal teams. And I was like, okay, uh, I can use this. I can attract them. Usually in Croatia, it was always like, no, no, no. Don't train futsal because if you go to futsal, you know, the, the parent has to pay 100 kuna or like 20 euros to the futsal team instead of to the football team. So then I was like, okay, I have to figure out how to merge them because they are more like a dog and the cats, you know? So th this was the idea throughout the tournaments, throughout all of this to get... And a lot of times when I would present to the parents, to the coaches, I use this example of me being in the Brazil and then seeing this as something that we can copy in our environment. So that was very, very interesting for me. And to be honest, like a eye-opening at some point. But it's it's part of our culture in Brazil, the futsal, and that's something when I when I came back to US, just to explain a little bit, uh, San Jose is located on the Northern California. It's a region with, when I came to the club in 2017, I'm the chief scout and recruitment for the club from the first team throughout the second team and also our academy. I help, I help it out to the whole, I organize the whole scouting department inside the club because when we came to the club, there was no scouting department. Um, the academy, we only had two coaches um, and made only two teams. That was in 2017. So that was the main reason when we, we took over myself and also the sporting director from the club to focus on this also identify and understanding our area. This is why it's so important. We don't have a residence. So different from Brazil when we were like most of the clubs in Serie A in Brazil, they had 60, 80s, almost 100 kids from all over Brazil living inside, inside their, you know, inside their, their club, right? They host those kids because Brazil is a very big country like USA. But here, we also have the homegrown rules for MLS. Another club from MLS, they cannot come inside San Jose and take a player out. So we need to understand the player's profile. And here in the Bay Area, we have a lot of high-tech companies. So families from India, from Asia, they're very big here. And we know 
you know the profiles, it's a little bit different. So I need to understand where those players from the poor families, from the Latinos, I mean, California is border with Mexico and most of the poor kids, you know, the low income players, families, they live outside the Bay Area, maybe 150 kilometers, 200 kilometers, 140 kilometers, why? The cost of living, it's very expensive here. So I visit all the clubs, I understand how they work. I look who work with futsal in the area. And the good thing was a Brazilian guy he has been here for more than 30 years. He was the one that developed most of the technical and futsal players because he had a lot of futsal principles. So the first visit I made it was to his academy. To see what, and then I saw one kid, he was in 2005, so he was 12 years old. When I saw this kid, I could see his quality on the ball and his futsal principles were different. You know, in this kid today, he's the best player on our under 17, he's a 2005. So this is how futsal, it's important. You know, in Brazil, it's part of our culture, as I said, and I try to understand why USA, with the weather they have here, very bad weather north of the country, they don't have, and they have the facilities. You can also always use the basketball courts and to transform and play futsal, right? So there is a, a very disorganized pipeline inside US soccer, futsal and everything. So we try to use that and apply. We hire a director of methodology from Spain, top notch person. We know Spain also use a lot of principle from futsal and we made our book, our methodology book and apply those futsal principles along with our game model that we have inside the club. And that was very important. And after three, four years, we only had one homegrown player on our first team when we came to the club. And now we have 10 homegrown players after three, four years of work. There is already nine, eight, nine new players we signed on a homegrown contract. We had the youngest player ever to sign an MLS homegrown contract from our academy. And we have a very good pipeline with the O4s, O5, O6. Those are players we re recruited three, four years ago. So this is how important it is a long, middle to long term project, Andrew. Different than we have in Brazil. In Brazil, uh -huh. there is a lot of change, political change in the clubs. Every two years, three years, there is a change of president. And Gustavo knows that well. He works for, I mean, worked for Fluminense for four years. Gustavo has been for three years in Corinthians. So even though Gustavo, he can win and develop the best players in Corinthians, sometimes for the mentality we have, it's changing a lot now in Brazil. That's a good, that's why Brazil, it's gonna be, it's improving a lot. We already could see, you know, the under 17, the 2002 generation, they won the under 17 World Cup in 2019. All those changes comes from mentality, right? And you need time, right? At least in America, that's a good thing, right? You have time to develop it and apply your principles. And this is my question to you also, Andrew. How does this work in Croatia, you know? Do you guys have time to implement those methodologies, those principles, or it's also tough for you? you no, know, every two, three years, they might have a new director or a new person that's going to come and change everything. So, uh, you remember this like line when I showed like a structure and unstructure, yeah? So, I think uh, when I was speaking about this, I was speaking about every uh, like a every cell of the country or of the society. So Germany is very similar to what you were saying. You know, Germans, they understand we need stability. They have Angela Merkel now for 16 years, yeah? Because they want to be stable. Now she's gonna change, but 16 years, that's something, wow. It's very similar in the clubs, even it's strong democracy, yeah? So you can always overthrow some, someone. It's not a dictatorship, but they understand we need stability. And obviously there is a goals, there is the things you have to do to keep the stability. Croatia, in the past, it's something similar as you mentioned the Brazil. Always some new president wants to get uh, this president out and then new guys coming and da da, da 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 He has his own people, he just cut everyone out and then it's like a circle. Uh, now, especially, you know, in Hajduk split, I can still say we change a lot of 
in in the other clubs as well in Croatian league we change a lot of head coaches in the first team we change a lot of sports directors but on the academy level everyone figure it out okay at least four maybe six to eight years it's necessary so there is not constant idea like ah let's change let's change so it's getting better and better i must i must say that it's getting better and better but it's been still far away from the level of germany or usa as you mentioned you know you come you agree you sign the contract and you work you know people respect the contracts you have a, you have a, you have a strategic plan for the long term and that's that's something very important if you're in the right directions you just keep going right and that's that's something that uh, i notice like a lot mostly for what you said in the beginning we south americans and also the croatians and some of the eastern europe we are very emotional right and we also we go by our heart. we got we got we got to have this and, and i mean that's something very 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 good and was one of the main reasons I want to experience this different environment. And also the clubs here, they're companies, right? They're, they have owners, right? They're not political. So there is the owner. We have the sporting director who runs the whole technical department. And you have the CEO of the club or the president that runs the whole business sides of the club. Then you have the owner and you have our goal to achieve and just got to keep going, right? You just got to keep moving. So there is no, not that many, uh, 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 you know, uh, people between. So you just got to have an idea. And most of the clubs in America, they are not um, clubs with a long history, different from San Jose. San Jose was born, uh, was, uh, 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 you know, uh, was born, the club was born in 1974 when the North American Soccer League, back when Pelé came to Cosmos, Cruyff, uh, Carlos Alberto Torres, so, but some clubs like Atlanta United, Nashville, some clubs are just, you know, three, four, four, five years ago. And the good thing is, even though those clubs are new clubs, it's important to already be born with an identity, right? And it's important to implement. And when you develop your game methodology, you gotta go back, I'm talking about Brazil, like Gustavo, Corinthians has a different style than Palmeiras. They have a different style than Sao Paulo because those are clubs with more than 100 years, right? So when you go back, you got to understand. You got to study. And that's something we try to understand. Understand your, your reality. Understand your culture. Understand your player's profile. Then focus on that. And this is why sometimes having less people, less players like you guys do, that's what happened to Holland in the 70s happened to Holland on the, when Holland, when the Ajax generation came up, they only had players to bring from Ajax, from PSV, maybe three, three more, you know, I'm talking about on the national team level. So you bring those players, you already have established your future and you're working on that, you know? On here, we are doing the same thing. We don't have that many players with the quality. So we gotta take these kids and develop those kids based on how you wanna move forward. In Brazil, Argentina, other county, it's very easy, right, Gustavo? Okay, a kid came for a tryout. He's better than what I have. Just bring him in and let it go, the other kid. You don't wanna spend the time developing the players because there is so many good players coming in our pipeline. And this is why we lose so many good players. And some kids, they just move from Corinthians, they go to Palmeiras and they just blossom because there was something hidden on the player. So in Croatia, Uruguay, here in America, we found something good on the player. We got to develop and working on that kid individually, technically, and mentally, right? That's why it's, I was, you know, bringing up this situation, you know, for different realities. You know, even though U.S., it's a big country, right? With more than 300 million people. We all know that soccer, football, it's not the first sport here. So we need to understand and bring the kids, many physical profile, Andrew. You know, the explosive players, the players with power and a good mentality, they usually go to American football, to basketball or to baseball. And now we start to bring these younger kids uh, with a better physical profile inside our soccer culture, where you're gonna be able to develop those players on better athletes. 
And a good example we have now is Terry DK, who everybody's been talking about in, in England, you know, for his physical profile and also his quality. Then we have Christian Pulisic, Brian Reynolds that went to Roma. Now all those kids are coming with different technical and physical profiles because there is better investment also in the MLS Academy, better coaching, you know, people from outside the country are coming and implementing their way of thinking the game. You know, of course, you're respecting the culture for every single club in every single city. So I just want to make this introduction and uh, also um, so you guys can also understand a little bit of how the things are moving inside in America. I don't know, I have a question because I wasn't there for seven years now. Uh, just bring, bring the mic close to your mouth, Andrew, please. Uh, I wasn't there for seven years and I remember you mentioned the positive things of basically full capitalism, right? The, there is owners and then owner have everyone under them. So there is the potential for having something very long term. Yeah. But I remember the, the negative side of that system was this like uh, football clubs. Yeah. That basically in USA, no one is going to do something if there is no return on the investment. Uh, and then obviously the kids from Mexican, uh, this little, uh, poor areas like Richmond, like uh, Berkeley uh, parts, Oakland parts that don't have a money to, I know maybe $2,000 was per year in order to play football. And this was like the kids would just, you know, give up or they would not they would come to high school maybe but that was the max like is that changing is it is it like is there i know there is some community clubs now slowly starting like sheriff fc or something so what is going on there with that situation andrew the thing is um, in mls now all the mls academies are full funded the owners they pay for everything so if a, if a kid come to san jose to la galax to la to other clubs from the U12 up, they don't have to pay anything. So that's already changed, right? So the league made a big, um, the, the club owners, they made a big investment in the last years based on this youth development, mainly the last four or five years, right after when you left, right? So this is why better players are coming in the pipeline because now there is a structure in place. Now there is a better scouting, there is better development. And the, these kids that they don't have the financial condition to pay, they are coming inside of our, our environment. Of course, when you're talking about MLS clubs, you're talking about 27 clubs, right? We're talking about maybe three, 4,000 players in a country with 300 million people. The other clubs, most of them, they still charging some of the kids, but what you gotta do? We gotta go in the communities. We gotta go to clubs, as you said, like the, you know, the clubs that we know, they are located in low income areas. Like here we have, we have Central Valley, who is three hours away driving from San Jose. It's an agricultural area with a lot of Latin American families. And I know people, you gotta also have a network of, of people that bring those kids at 10, 11, 12, 13 years old to play some recreational game. And then we can go and identify those kids. If you see this kid is good enough, then we're gonna find a way, but it's still a long way to go. I'm, I'm sure, but the, the beginning, there is already a light in the end of the tunnel with the MLS clubs. And now MLS is also responsible for the biggest tournament, you know, uh, academy tournament in America. It's called MLS Next. It started right, less, right with the pandemic, when the pandemic re reached. So um, US soccer, they don't have anything to do anymore with the, 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 the youth tournament. So the top youth tournament now, it's, it's uh, organized by MLS. So the good thing is now, the MLS, they have, besides their MLS clubs, they have 100, 150 other clubs. They're not MLS clubs, where they can also scout it and they can also implement, you know, in a, uh, their own way, you know. So we as a club, we can also identify players from these other clubs and bring inside an MLS academy and develop those players. Sorry, just to, to come in this discussion, you said about the Boucher and the, the systems and the pillars and two pillars of the, that she cites that it, that's the competitive systems 
and the level of investment for, for you to have success in the talent development. And I, I believe that it's one of the reasons that Brazil has also uh, so many players because, because we have so many levels of players. We have such a huge competitive systems here with so many clubs that allows you with different levels to cope with your learning moment or your actual level. So when you cite the flow channel, that also it's important for the coach to, to try to make this work and they go in the up border of the flow channel. We can see that in the macro level also because here, like here, if you have different level of players, because it's so culture football, he will find a way. Maybe it's not Palmeiras, maybe it's not Corinthians, but it will be an uh, interior club, a uh, nearby house club that will play against Corinthians and you play against Palmeiras and, and you participate in different tournaments. Uh, and it allows you to go to other states to find a way. And, and uh, this, this brings us to, uh, to, to find balance in the end of the, the, the way. So, so I, I think it, it's an important uh, thing here. And the other thing is how we do this. Like I, I want to, we have the Copa São Paulo also that uh, Bruno knows well. It's a very, very traditional tournament that happens in January in, in São Paulo that it's an under 20 uh, tournament that 128 clubs from all around Brazil participates. And it's in a place that everybody can scout and see and look for these the, this players and, and uh, this kind of thing. So the competitive system, it's uh, important we have here as, as long as the investment. We also invest a lot in this, like uh, we have teams that invest four or five million euros a year in the youth academy, and and this is also uh, a way to develop. Yeah, I I, uh, I have nothing to say. Absolutely agree, and it's uh, I, I I I've been there. I think in January. No, I came in February, so I was a little late. But I heard about this tournament. You know the. The thing that's happening now in Europe is, uh, you know, I was speaking about Croatia, but uh, Europe, European Union, yeah, this, I think, 26 now countries after Great Britain left. Uh, we have so many tournaments, for example, that are U8, U19s are going to France, to Poland, and David is one of the guys, Andre probably knows in Portugal. So we, we also have this, like, a straight on competition even from the earliest ages so basically european union i think it's uh, or no europe is like 500 million people so you are get slowly getting like a competition of not only 4 million between each other but like bigger and bigger as the kids are getting selected or identified so I, I how is uh under uh, just to, to go over um because uh, the good thing, as you said, Brazil is a continental continental country, so it's to go from South Brazil to North Brazil, it's going to take you four or five days driving by car, right? It's going to take you five hours flight. It's pretty similar from what we have here. So it's, and the good things, there is a good, the good and the bad things, right? The, the, the bad thing is it's tough for the clubs and also the players from North and North, North, Northeast of Brazil or Northwest to have an opportunity to be seen in a high level competition. So this is why most of the money, the rich cities in Brazil are South Brazil and, and central, you know, Southwest of Brazil. That's where Sao Paulo, Minas Gerais state, you know, Rio de Janeiro state and, you know, Rio Grande do Sul, that's like Grêmio and Inter is. And we, we have some clubs up, you know, up, up, up North. And that's why the Brazil Federation, and I was, I was part of this movement in 2012 when I was working when I was the chief scout for the for the Brazil 
youth national teams, and we got it together. And we spoke inside the Brazil Federation how important it was for the Federation to take care and be responsible to, to organize the most important tournaments. Before, the state federations, they were responsible to organize the tournaments. Sao Paulo State, they organized um, Copa Sao Paulo U20, who is a very traditional tournament. This is where we recruit some players for the youth national team. Then we also had a Copa Votorantin. That's a U15 tournament organized by Votorantin. It's a city, um, it's a city in Sao Paulo State. Uh, Minas Gerais State, they had Taça Belo Horizonte. That was a big tournament, U20, in the middle of the year. And there was another big U17. So basically, myself as a chief scout for the Brazil national team, I didn't have that many tournaments besides the state tournaments. And what I was doing, I was going to the clubs and organizing games between the clubs so we could scout players. So beginning 2012, the Brazil Federation started organizing the Brazilian Cup U20, then after the Brazilian Cup U17, and now the Brazilian uh, Tournament Championship U20 and the Brazilian Championship U17. So that gave you a very high level game and opportunity for a lot of players, a lot of clubs, you know, and that was very good. On the other side, the scouting department for the Brazilian clubs, they improved a lot. Today, if you go to Brazil, the top clubs, they're gonna have 15, maybe 20 scouts all over the nation. And they have the structure to identify kids also in these tournaments from small states. I'm from Rondo Rondonia. Rondonia is one of the smallest states in Brazil in the Amazon area. So for a player from Rondonia to be seen, they need to come Three, three, you know, 3,000 kilometers to play a game or to play a tournament. Now, now we have TV, my Kuju, it's broadcasting all the games. You know, you can see on Y Scout. So today also, Andrew, it's much easier to see a kid and also to analyze a player. But the thing is, as a former academy director and as a chief scout, you know how important it is to develop scouts that's gonna understand and know how to smell the grass. When you say Brazil smell the grass, it's watching a player on video is one thing. And we see a lot of people working today and the pandemic, the pandemic will help this a lot. A lot of people are getting the certificates, are getting the degrees beside a computer, watching players on computer and using that analysis. This is very, very important. And I agree. But go to tournaments, understand your KPIs, your key performance indicator, understanding close to the field, the body reaction, the body language, the player's reality, have a chance to speak maybe to the player or to a coach or to a parent. I mean, those things are fundamental on talent ID, right? The social understanding. So we could be here for the whole day talking about this, but those are things that we don't have to make people adapt to ourselves. We have to adapt to the places reality, right? When I go to Croatia, if I go to Croatia to work one day, I'm gonna have to adapt to the reality of that. And many people, they want people to adapt to who they are and that's, doesn't, that doesn't work, right? So it's important, it's a big discussion because this has a lot to do with methodology, with talent ID, with culture, with a lot of things, right? So this is something I'm passionate about. I love this kind of conversation, you know, and only being in Brazil for some time made, made you understand things a little bit different. And I think Gustavo can talk a little bit more about this also, but it's amazing. When you bring here inside America, they have the reality. The kids, they come to train with a BMW. They come with a, with a Mercedes. That's why their parents, Tesla car. That's how the parents, they have financially the condition to drive them. We don't have public transportation here, right? So every kid comes to train, you know, you know either the parents want to drive them in a nice car, but that's part of the culture, right? And we got to know who it is. Okay, and, and uh, I work with elite youth football for 15 years and 13 years was working in a in company club. Like I told, uh, it was, a owner club and where the process was so important and were built and 
were con constructed with good professionals uh, working every day on it. And it was very good. It's helped, helped me a lot. Lear I learned a lot about that. And, but I think the importance of culture, like you are saying, Bruno, is very, very important. And the most important thing for me to work with Youth Academy is to have a place and an environment where people believe, where people and players believe on the process. Where, when they think that this will give them what they want, that's a chance to go to the high level. And I had some difficult to see that uh, working on these company clubs that didn't develop the culture to put uh, youth players in the professional system. And now I work in the, in the club that has this, like you said, the players feels, feels they smells this every day. They know that Marquinhos were here, William were here in the same dressing room that they, they go today. And sometimes we have here, like uh, we use the, the facilities of the, our old professional use. So we have uh, some locker rooms, some lockers that are so old that maybe Neto, a great player from Corinthians, use it. And, and when you go through, you have guys that work here that for so long that they they worked with those those players and now they are telling stories about them and how they were in under 17 and how they went through to be a top player in the world so i think this is very important uh, to have an envir environment where everybody believes that they going through the right path so i feel i feel what you, you say, Bruno, uh, I, I can see this every day with, with my players. They desire that. So, guys, the conversation is really good, but unfortunately, we have to, we have to end it. Uh, we, can, we can do this. We can do this again if you want. I want it for sure. Uh, but... Uh, we are we are short in time at the moment, so uh, we passed the two hours of of, uh, of event. Um, no worries, Andrew. No worries about that. Okay. <laughs> um, but um, top top level. Thank you, Andrew, for your presentation and for your uh, for your input and, and knowledge knowledge sharing. Uh, Bruno, the same. Okay. Uh, Bruno and Gustavo, um, I know that you had few time, few time to to talk about talk about Talent ID and development, but uh, I know that for sure that uh, we will see we will see we will see each other again because uh, it's uh, quality quality professionals that uh, elite performance football is uh, is made of. So uh, I will I will contact you again for sure. Both of you, um, Bruno, thank you for for participating because uh, Bruno is uh, is working in a different reality. The, the the American reality is different from our European European reality and from from Gustavo as well. But with an input, uh, with the short time that he had, he gave us a, a perspective of the American football and how it works uh, in the the MLS academies and the MLS clubs. Because it's it's a different reality as I, as I as I talked about, uh, and Andrew talked about as well the high school and the college soccer. Uh, it's different than, you, than Europe because our players are in the clubs and still in the clubs and uh, until they they're getting pro contracts. And the America, it's it's a little bit different. Uh, and Gustavo as well. Uh, thank you very much for your for your input about the Brazilian football uh, and. The, the, your perspective from, from the clubs that you've been work on and at the same time from Corinthians and the reality of Corinthians in the, in the Sao Paulo area because you have big clubs as well uh, around you and it's uh, even if it's an area with a lot of population it's, uh, 
big rivalry and at the same time that rivalry comes to this this thematics the talent id and development um for everyone that was was in the attendance thank you very much for um, for uh, being here and uh, for showing interest in, in this event uh we will have more of this for sure because uh what we do we do we do this for football and uh to sharing knowledge with everyone and having the best the best uh performance of football and soccer <laughs> this time uh with us to sharing to sharing their knowledge and their expertise so andro bruno and gustavo big thank big thank you for for being here and um to everyone here thank you and uh let's hope that football can come back to its normal normality as fast as we can and uh we can see each other physically and uh try to to talk and to to have these moments in person and uh i think we can uh, we can do this for sure in the future thanks thanks thank you andre and uh, i i put in my i put in my instagram on the on the chat bruno costa 80 so whoever whoever wants to let me, you know reach out to me also my linkedin just feel free to ask me some questions i'm always open and willing to help so thank you very much andro i'm going to get our contact with andre and also gustavo so andre send me the you know the both gustavo and andro phone numbers and so we, i can exchange some you know message and i'm here whenever you come back to the bear andro feel free to visit my friend well do for sure Okay, thank you guys. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very Bye -bye. much.